Are you ready to take your business to the next level? Every day, there are countless books and articles that are published offering the key on how to make your business a success. It's easy to feel overwhelmed trying to keep up and run your business. That's why Deb Creer created the Business Power Hour. Keep up on the latest trends, best practices, and techniques for how to make your business a success. Let the Business Power Hour do the heavy work for you. Good morning, good morning. I am Deb Creer, and I am passionate about giving professionals the tools that they need to make themselves and their businesses as successful as possible. And oh my gosh, I am so excited to be talking to my guest today. I was reading his book into the wee small hours of last night because it was such a fascinating book. And, and I did tell him this during the, the, the our pre-chat, I got to the last one, I went, wait a minute, there's more, wait, wait, now what? And so we're really gonna be talking about the now what part. And, and things like that. But please join me in welcoming Donald Thompson to our program today. Welcome, Donald. How the heck are you doing? I'm doing amazing, Deb. It is uh, really great to be here and spend some, some quality time with you uh, and our audience. Perfect. I love it. So let me tell people a little bit about you and then we will dive into this. Okay. So Donald Thompson is CEO and co-founder of the Diversity Movement. He is the author of Underestimated, a CEO's Unlikely Path to Success. Donald is an entrepreneur, public speaker, author, podcaster, certified diversity executive, which is a CDE, and an executive coach. He serves as a board member for Easter Seals UCP, Vidant Medical Center, Raleigh Chamber, Town Bank Raleigh, and several other organizations in the fields of technology, marketing, sports, and entertainment. So again, Donald, welcome. Glad to be here, and thank you uh, for giving me this, this time. Great. Well, I always like to find out from my guests how it is that they got to where they are today. And you do talk about that a lot in your book, and I love that story. But tell us a little bit more about how it is that you have discovered what your passion in life is. So thanks so much for the question. One of the things that's really <laughs> exciting about the work that I get to do today is it's really a culmination, right, of the journey that I've taken. Mm -hmm. and when I think about how things started, uh, and I'll talk about being an entrepreneur, I think first, mm -hmm. uh, it really takes me back to selling Jolly Ranchers in elementary school. I love that story. It, 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 and it, it always makes me smile to think about it because mm -hmm. number one, I wanted to earn my own money. Right. So that is something that I think is powerful as a young mm -hmm. person, right? I, I didn't mind getting an allowance, doing chores around the home. That mm -hmm. wasn't my money. Right. I wanted money that I could buy whatever I wanted. Mm -hmm. I wanted mm -hmm. choices. And so the second thing is I had to be smart with it. I wasn't the only kid selling candy in school. Mm -hmm. And so I had to make sure I had different flavors. I had mm -hmm. to make sure I had a little, uh, had a little squad to where I had candy in different lockers around. And I actually was running a little business and I had a little assistant that was helping me. And I met with resistance. Right. Right. Because I was breaking some rules. Mm -hmm. The school right. said no. no, no, no. <laughs> the school said no several times. Mm -hmm. and, and then my parents were called. I think, <laughs> and, and we had some high octane conversations about that for sure. Mm -hmm. But the thing that catapulted that experience into the way that I've kind of viewed my life is that I wanted the kind of control that you only achieve through running and owning your own business. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't mean that if you're inside of a corporation, you can't have some semblance of control. Mm -hmm. I wanted to see my ideas come to life. Right. And so I knew at an early age that I wanted to try things. Mm -hmm. and so as I went through school as a son of a, a football coach, I then looked at athletics. I didn't just play football, even though football was where I grew the, the, the furthest and the fastest in mm -hmm. terms of college scholarship. I played soccer for a season. I played baseball. Mm. I was wrestling <laughs> and mm -hmm. with the garbage bag around me, trying to make weight and mm -hmm. running around in, in different things. And then I gravitated to football where I thought I could go the furthest. Mm -hmm. And what did I learn there that is bringing me to where I am today is you don't do anything significant by yourself. Mm -hmm. You have to get up when you're knocked down. Mm -hmm. And winning takes a lot of preparation and hard work. And even then, mm -hmm. chance that somebody could be better so you never want to let up in how hard you're working to be the best that you can be. Mm -hmm. And so in bringing that forward to then my business career, 
I gravitated towards sales. And so mm-hmm. here's why. One, I could make money on performance. That's right. that entrepreneurial. It's that selling those Jolly Ranchers. That selling those Jolly mm-hmm. Ranchers. So number one. And then number two, I could learn about a lot of different businesses through sales. Mm-hmm. Because you can't sell a technology product. You can't sell a financial product. You can't sell a website in marketing mm-hmm. if you don't understand how to make the customer's business better. Right. Ultimately, when we think about the audience we're talking to today is small business owners, emerging businesses, because small businesses don't stay small. Right. Right. So there's a lot That's of. That's the goal. You want to grow. Mm-hmm. You want to grow. You want to emerge. You want to do different things. Mm-hmm. And so I figured that if I could sell and learn the business aspects of being a professional salesperson, mm-hmm. I could transfer those skills to any business and any endeavor. Mm-hmm. And that was kind of the green light to then help me then become an entrepreneur. Mm-hmm. Right. You know, and I loved, like I said, I loved reading your book. And one of the things that was so impressive to me was you came from such a strong family, um, you know, and, and, and I loved reading about Big Daddy, who I'm assume has passed um, yeah. just because of our, our ages, right? Yeah. But the fact that he told you that you were going to be the first millionaire in the family, and then it was just kind of a given. You know, <laughs> whatever you, you're, you're going to do that, um, you know, and, 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 you know, having both parents who were very well educated, very um, oriented towards education and towards always making sure that you and your sister bettered yourselves. I think that was just so important. So talk about those role models. So it's both the roles models and privilege. Mm-hmm. And a lot of times we think about the opportunities we've had and that we're Mm self-made and I've done a lot of hard work, Mm -hmm. but man, I'm on the shoulders of giants. I know somebody named big daddy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so when I think about my family in deep South, Mm -hmm. right. Bogalusa, Louisiana Mm -hmm. and the educational disparities, Mm -hmm. right. Between the deep South, Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama. Mm -hmm. Especially at the time when you were growing up. The time I was growing up, it was a phenomenal advantage that my parents decided to move away from all of their family mm-hmm. and, and relocate and build their lives in Stores, Connecticut, mm-hmm. which is where the University of Connecticut was, where my dad got a football scholarship. So sports was really a way that transformed our entire family and the future legacy of our family. Mm-hmm. And so having those role models is not so much just because they were well-educated, because I knew the price they had to pay for that education. It's not just that they were solid in giving examples for for me and my sister, it's the things I saw them go without Mm -hmm. so that we could have more. And and I have never forgot that, Mm -hmm. right? I don't don't wake up a day not being thankful (laughs) for having Mm -hmm. those doors open and then I ran through those doors, Mm -hmm. right? To try to be- Right, it was your choice. It was my mm-hmm. choice not to take for granted the mm-hmm. sacrifices that people made on my behalf. And so I am forever indebted to, to my parents, to my big dad, to my granny, those folks that sewed into me so early. And here's the big thing that I'll tell you, Deb, and I'll give an example, uh, somebody that I met at a conference. When we're growing young people and aspirations and goals, one of the reasons I've been able to be successful is because there were not limitations placed on me on how big I could dream. Mm-hmm. I was encouraged to do that. Mm-hmm. My, I remember when we would go on vacations and my parents would scrape together what little money that we had to go on these vacations. But it was important to my mom that I went to the Boston Children's Museum, mm-hmm. which is a world-renowned museum mm-hmm. right, in, our, in our country. Mm-hmm. It was important that we went to D.C. and we walked uh, the, the buildings of, of Congress and different things mm-hmm. so that I could be exposed Mm -hmm. and that my mind could grow. Fast forward, I was at a conference last week and it is was put on by Black Enterprise Mm -hmm. uh, magazine. It was called Black Men Excel. Mm -hmm. There were 600 African-American leaders from all over the country Mm -hmm. at this conference. And I was one of the uh, speakers on a handful of the panels. I met an airline pilot from American Airlines and I asked him, how did you know you wanted to be a pilot? Mm -hmm. And he told me a quick story of being six years old with his mom going on a plane and deathly afraid. Oh, 
his mom got and the steward, uh, the, the, the airline attendant took him into the cockpit when that was a thing you could do. Right. Him. You can still do that. Mm -hmm. right? so that dates us when the world wasn't like, <laughs> I know. Right? Mm -hmm. but the pilots were gracious to him. They gave him a little pin. Mm -hmm. They talked to him about what the instruments did. Mm -hmm. And that little boy left that cockpit, not only excited to be on the plane, mm -hmm. but a new vision for what right. he could be. I could do plane. that. I can do mm -hmm. that. And so part of the reason that I'm so uh, impassioned about the book that, that we've just written, uh, Underestimated, right? A CEO's Unlikely Path to Success, mm -hmm. is I want my story to be inspirational to people that might not have a college degree. Mm -hmm. They might not have gone to the right school. They might not have started out right with the right job that they can do it to. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, and, and I was part of a, a mastermind group yesterday and, and one of the, the, they always start with a, a question and, you know, and, and just, you know, kind of, she calls it the icebreaker, but it's, it's, you know, kind of how we get to know each other. And it was, you know, how did your family influence who you are today? And it was all women. So for the most part, we said our moms, um, but in amongst all of that, one of the, the things that was brought up was one adult taking time to care for a kid can make a huge difference you know and and whether it's a teacher a parent um you know maybe you're a little bit older i mean you talk in your book about how you form some relationships with with uh mentors who were quite a bit older you mm -hmm. know somehow just having that one adult that believes in you can make such a difference for for kids and i'm saying kids of any age right but you know really you know in that those formative years junior high ish and high school i think you know are, are probably that the, the years but having that one person who says i believe in you and right. i know that you can be great can, can outweigh almost all of the other negatives it is um that's a powerful statement not only do i agree i would i would extend that to as we're thinking about professional growth mm -hmm. and how do we continue to grow and prosper? Cause we're always changing. Mm -hmm. I'm not the same person in my fifties, right? right? Which is like, wow, you know, mm -hmm. right. Um, that I was in my thirties, that I was in my forties. There's a, there's that, that growth and that maturity, but we all need somebody that believes in us mm -hmm. that we can pick up the phone and talk to mm -hmm. during those down moments. Right. And one of the big challenges that people face um, with all the crazy that's going on in the world is we have a lot of folks that we consider like associates, right? Followers on LinkedIn, Facebook friends, different things. But those of us that are fortunate enough to have mentor and friends that we can really talk with and work through things with, there's an emotional strength there that can help you fight the battles that we all face in work and life and different things and be so much stronger. And I was very blessed and fortunate that I had multiple adults in my life that just believed the best in me. And even during times, and you know, in the book, we talk about, I was in and out of trouble in middle school a lot. And, and as a young kid, not anything too much, but- Nothing like, serious. Mm -hmm. Nothing serious, but like, I spent my fair share of time in the principal's office. Mm -hmm. right? and, and I was a I was a rambunctious kid and I got bored easily. Mm -hmm. and. People didn't really know how to how to take that, especially this young black kid with a lot of ideas, mm -hmm. right? And, and mostly uh, the only one or one of the few in the schools that I was in. Mm -hmm. And so I had to figure out a way moving around a lot in my younger years because I am the son of a football coach mm -hmm. to make friends and be in new environments quickly. Right. And that was really tough as a young person. Mm -hmm. Back to your original question of how did I get to where I am as a business person. It has become one of my dominant strengths. Right. You and learned I, networking before you knew it was called networking. Or I knew it was a thing. Mm -hmm. Is exactly right. So no, thanks for that question. Mm -hmm. I love it. You know, and I, I, I have to admit, every time I, I was in your book and, and reading the name of where you grew up, which was Bogalusa, I giggled a little bit. <laughs> um, and, and I was just envisioning this tiny little town mm -hmm. because I grew up in a very small town in the mountains of Colorado. Now I had 32 in my graduating class, my high school graduating class. And it's, it's uh, unfortunately, it's just gotten smaller. But what struck me was that you never ever saw that as a negative. 
you know, we, we, you know, the, the kids who grow up with, uh, you know, every advantage because they're in big, big areas where they have much better schools, all of those things. But, you know, again, you did, you know, move up to, to Connecticut, but yeah, that, but to me, that small town background, if, at least in my view, for me is an advantage Yeah, because it, it shows things that, you know, a lot of people never experienced. One of the biggest things in my parents, my mom and my dad taught me a lot. But one of the biggest things that I carry with me every day is that you have to win with the cards that you're dealt, mm -hmm. right? And that has stayed with me uh, even to this day. And so when I look out at the world, I look at the world through my blessings to then to my challenges. Right. And by doing that, by the time I get to my challenges, mm -hmm. I'm thankful, mm -hmm. I'm energized, and I'm ready to attack them. Right. When I look at the world through the lens of my challenges, then I can get defeated mm -hmm. and I can get down. Right. By the time I get to the opportunities, I'm tired and I'm weighed down. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you don't even see them. Mm -hmm. You don't even see them. And so that thought process, that scrappiness, mm -hmm. that hustle, if you will, that um, perseverance is, I think, the right word, is something that has was modeled by my parents in a big way. Mm -hmm. and, and, um, and, and that small, they when they left Bogalusa to go to Connecticut, that they wanted to make their family, their town proud of what they did because mm -hmm. that was a big move in that day. Right. Right. For what they did. So mm -hmm. that makes, then I appreciate the question very much. Right. You know, and, and it is, it is a challenge coming from where we came from. Um, you know, I'm a, <clears throat> a little older than you. <laughs> and so when, you know, I, I'm right at the, the end of baby boomer and that's when girls you know, we're still not really encouraged to go to college, um, you know, or if you did, you got one of those female degrees. You became a teacher, a nurse. Now, those are, I absolutely love those professions. I think those are two of the most underpaid professions and underappreciated professions in the, in the world. But that was, that was kind of the, the options that I had. And my mother said, uh-uh, no. Now it was, it was a given that I was going to college. I mean, these kids who get gap years, oh, that would have never happened. <laughs> um, and so she was that person who said, you're gonna do this. Now she never told me, you know, you're, you're going to, you know, what degrees or anything. It was just, you're gonna do this and you're gonna do it to the best of your ability. And much like your, especially your mom, when I was reading, you didn't wanna do anything to disappoint them because that was the worst punishment of all. That's right. I mean, and I think that, you know, when I think back on those things that I write about in the book and, and how I was raised, mm -hmm. um, we had high standards as mm -hmm. a family because we were representing those that didn't have the opportunities, that right. We, right, number one. Mm -hmm. And then the second thing is we didn't want to squander the amazing life we were trying to build. Mm -hmm. And so my parents talked to me about the realities of the world. Mm -hmm. So when I became an adult and I experienced microaggression and mm -hmm. racism and different things, I was still hurt by it, mm -hmm. but I wasn't shocked by it. Right. It didn't, it didn't slow me to a stop because I was mm -hmm. the only person mm -hmm. that I, that I was in a business environment with for many, many years of my career mm -hmm. in the, in the technology space. Right. right? But it strengthened me, my mm -hmm. resolve. And the thing that I, I think happens a lot, especially today, is we're talking about diversity, equity, inclusion, and different things. We make it about race, sexual orientation, gender, but diversity, equity, inclusion is really a very, very broad construct. Right. When you think mm -hmm. about generational, mm -hmm. right? When you think about um, neurodiversity, mm -hmm. right? Disabilities. Mm -hmm. So when you think about it broadly, we all have things that make us unique. Mm -hmm. And when we think about really amplifying the, the, the points of uniqueness of each other, it creates common ground a lot faster. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the things that I try to bring to the table in everything that I do. And one of the things that is um, really near and dear to my heart is when <clears throat> we work with clients of the diversity movement and we talk about diversity, equity, inclusion, what we're really trying to do is help people build better businesses. Right. And so when you think about it from that construct, now all of a sudden we're helping build better leaders, mm -hmm. we're helping create better pay equity, right? Mm -hmm. Across genders, 
we're helping to recruit from different places mm-hmm. so that you can create a more diverse mix within your company. So what we've done very simply is we've said to leaders, let's not think about DEI from the things that you don't understand. Mm-hmm. Let's think about DEI from the things that you do. Mm-hmm. Would you want your wife, your mother, your sister, your cousin that is female to make the same money for the same job? Mm-hmm. Yes, I would. Right. Mm-hmm. And, and we're perplexed that anybody says no, but it happens. But it happens, right? And so we create that common ground from very simple things. Do you want everyone that's in a meeting to feel like they have the opportunity to contribute? Mm -hmm. Well, of course I would. Well, then let's make sure that we bring those that are more introverted into the conversation. Right. So when I'm talking to small business owners and they say, well, how does this DEI stuff matter to me? My company's 10 people or 50 people or 100 people. I'm not this multinational corporation. It all comes back to, Do we want to build a better business that can win in the marketplace no matter the economy? Mm -hmm. The answer to that is yes. Then let's talk about how to structure our employee base to do just that. Right. You know, and and it's it can be a challenge, but I think you know, one of the things that that I have seen COVID, you know, for all of its icks and nasties and, and things, I think one of the things that has benefited the most is DEI because of like some of the work from home and and things like that so you know and and <clears throat> and being able to get people from all over you know and and so not only maybe are you allowing people who have physical disabilities to be able to work you're also getting people from multicultural you know different countries all these things so talk is it is that just purely a guess on my part or is that something that you've seen that is something that we see significantly. If you think about a parent that is struggling with integrating work and life, a lot of it is pick up in the morning, drop off the kids, different things of that nature. When you are working from home and you have a little bit more flexibility in your schedule, mm-hmm. you can still be productive, mm-hmm. but you can manage your life a little bit better. Mm-hmm. We also found that a lot of things that people, whether it's disabilities, whether it's parents, the stress of work has to do with that integration, not the balance. Mm -hmm. COVID has shown us how we can be more productive no matter where we sit. Right. And that has created a lot of flexibility. Mm -hmm. You mentioned the global footprint. Mm -hmm. We're absolutely seeing that. So now instead of having a job posting, if you have a company in Alabama, you can recruit all over the country Mm -hmm. and people don't necessarily have to relocate to where you are to help support and grow your company. Mm -hmm. So we've seen that diversity of work. We've seen the future of work really expand how employers (laughs) and employees are thinking about the workplace, Mm -hmm. how to really build teams together. The only downside we've seen in terms of hybrid working and different things is not getting the work done. It is the mentorship for future leaders. Right. That that one-on-one connection. That's the part that I think we have to really balance because there is a bias in many organizations for FaceTime. Right. There is a communication challenge if the leadership is more in the office and the broader organization is more remote. Mm-hmm. Those that are, have a more physical proximity to leadership, there is some bias that we're right. working on. Yeah, and just because they bump into them in the hall every day, things like that. that. Mm-hmm. And, and proximity is how you build relationships. Proximity Mm -hmm. is how you build empathy. Mm -hmm. So what we've done is we've encouraged leaders and team members to make sure that they are present. We have, um, we're a small team at the diversity movement, about 20 folks, but we have one of our key partners that is in Houston, Texas. Mm -hmm. And we make sure that when we're doing company events, Mm -hmm. that their calendar is available for them to fly in. Yeah. When we do company lunches, we make mm-hmm. sure we still have the Zoom camera on. Mm-hmm. We send them a gift card mm-hmm. and we still include. Right. So they're dining with you. Mm-hmm. They're, they're dining with us. And so you have to do smart things mm-hmm. to make sure that the advantage of, of, of a diverse workforce are there, mm-hmm. but they also manage to some of the implicit kind of downsides that come with everyone being a little bit more spread out. Right. You know, and, and I've home officed for 20 years, <clears throat> but... It's, I, I know that there is that advantage, that proximity advantage of being able to pop into somebody's office and say, you know, how, what'd you think about that game last night? Um, you know, or, you know, hey, I've got this idea. 
you know, and, and so technology is kind of having to catch up to that because we don't really want our Zoom cameras on all the time. Um, you know, but it's also, it, it is, it, it, but it, I, I agree that, you know, the biggest challenge is when you have kind of a mix. So you've got the people who aren't in the office and then those that are. <clears throat> and that's that's been one of the, the complaints that I've heard is people have said, I didn't get the promotion because I'm not in the office. I wasn't reminding them of my presence. And I somebody told me that and I said, were you reminding them of your presence? Crickets. <laughs> you know, and and I mean that really was it. They they weren't taking now, you know, it's not like you could just pop in all the time. I mean, it does it does make it more of a challenge. But I said, were you reminding them that you were an integral part of that project, or you know, all of those things? And they well, yeah. One of the no, I appreciate you bringing that up because a lot of leaders that are listening to this and a lot of emerging leaders, you have to brand yourself in an authentic way mm-hmm. at the office. Right. That's whether you're sitting there or not. And mm-hmm. one of the cool things that I talk to folks that I'm, when I'm working with emerging uh, leaders as a coach is sending your manager and your manager's manager a weekly update email, Mm -hmm. a bi-weekly update email that just hits the highlights. And I usually tell them to do it in this bucket. What's working that you're really proud of Mm -hmm. and share that with them, Mm -hmm. right? What are some of the challenges that you're working on and what are the status of those challenges? Mm -hmm. And then what are some of the things that you're observing in the organization that they might not be interested in, that they might not see, Mm -hmm. your point of view, that gives you an opportunity to uh, pat on the the back, so to speak, a colleague, Mm -hmm. right? To say something that you've seen in the press about your company that you're really proud of. Mm -hmm. But that weekly email starts to be, and and I recommend people do it at the same time each week, Mm -hmm. not sporadic. Mm -hmm. And if you do it every other week, that's fine. That's not the, the issue. But make it a habit. Make it a habit. And all of a sudden now your manager and your managers start to count on mm-hmm. those updates right. and reply. And then here's the powerful thing. When you put in some of those cool things that you're doing, there's this little copy and paste thing. Mm-hmm. It's shared across the organization right. without you even knowing it. Mm-hmm. And so I do encourage people to be a bit more intentional Mm-hmm. with their leadership in terms of their communication. And then mm-hmm. the second thing that I encourage with hybrid work is the video conferencing tools are really good. Mm-hmm. Same mm-hmm. way you do a five-minute cup of coffee, you might do it a couple times a week with mm-hmm. different folks. You certainly can hit somebody up on Slack or whatever messaging tool and say, do you have five minutes? I just want to see how you're doing. Mm-hmm. Two things. Number one, you never know the value of a smile to your coworker. Right. 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 And that's just something that you can never underestimate. Mm -hmm. And the second thing, if you feel a little bit disconnected, you're not the only one. Mm -hmm. And so those are two things that I recommend folks to really be champions in that hybrid environment. Right. You know, and and when COVID was really at its extremes and, and nobody was in the office, one of the things that I heard a lot of people talk about was they knew their employees were struggling, but you know, they, they couldn't put their fingers on it, you know, and, and some of it was just like when they started, you know, initially they were nicely dressed, you know, and then things declined and all of a sudden, you know, they're, they're unkempt. Oh, that's a pretty good indicator that maybe somebody's struggling, but you know, when you see them in an office, you can pick those things up. And so I think it's, it's been a challenge for managers to, especially, you know, when they, at, may, might not have those skills or, or things like that to really be figuring out how can I best serve my employees? What are they missing? Um, you know, when you're only on this little screen every once in a while. It's it's really tough. And and as a leader, I, I had to develop some what I call cheat codes to mm-hmm. try to, 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 to get through. The one thing that I tell managers in particular, <clears throat> don't jump right in to the business dialogue. One of the reasons this conversation is so much fun and so natural is we spent some time in the beginning before we hit record, just chatting a little right. bit and getting to know each other a little mm-hmm. bit so that now as we're talking, it just it's just fun. I'm talking mm-hmm. to a friend. When you're talking with your, your team, even if you have a 15, 20 minute meeting, mm-hmm. it's amazing how efficient that 15 minutes will be if you take two to three minutes 
just to check the pulse. Mm -hmm. hey, tell me something that's going on with your kids. Right. right. That you tell me, tell me something that you're super excited on XYZ and giving people that release, if you will, is super important as a manager. And you have to be much more intentional about that mm -hmm. because you're not going to be able to be as intuitive. Right. So we're, you're not able to be as intuitive. You have to be more intentional. Mm -hmm. and, and that's super important. The other thing is that I highly recommend that people don't have hybrid work days that are different. Mm. I think it's very important that if you're going to have in office days, mm -hmm. that you have in office days with teams that are able to actually be together, mm -hmm. right? Versus it being sporadic amongst the organization that you're right. leading. So if every Wednesday is the team day, mm -hmm. And people can look forward to that. You might have some other days that are floating and as needed, but you might have one day a week that's the same. So you can keep those relationships mm -hmm. fresh. At our firm, every two weeks, we do a team training. Mm -hmm. So we'll have an outside speaker come in. Um, last month, uh, last two weeks, we did uh, mental health, mental well being mm -hmm. in the office. Uh, the time before that, we did um, unconscious bias. Mm -hmm. And we're a DEI firm, and we built. Mm -hmm technologies with that but we still know that we have mm -hmm. to right. mm -hmm. this week um and in fact it'll be this afternoon at one o'clock it is on professional presence mm. right over zoom mm -hmm. and in presentations right because most of your emerging leaders are communicating with others about their business mm -hmm. the reason we do this is when teams learn together and interact in something mm -hmm. new you're doing a bonding exercise right? A little bit at a time. Right. And keeping people connected mm -hmm. while we're learning something mm -hmm. new. Right. And, and we are getting very used to the whole virtual thing. Um, I have not been to an in-person networking event since before COVID, oh, you I, know, and, I, and it's just, I, you know, it's, it's interesting. And I tell people, why do I want to put on shoes? Um, you know, and, and, <laughs> but I do all of my networking online through a variety of things. Um, but I sat down after about a year, you know, when things in here in Georgia, of course, we opened back up very quickly. Um, you know, things things started opening up in May of 2020. And, and so some of the groups I belong to had started meeting again. Now, I have health concerns. And so, you know, it's like, no, I'm not not going to do that. But even once that was no longer an issue, I sat down and I thought, what am I missing mm. by not going the social? I mean, I definitely missed seeing those people. And even if you were doing, you know, the elbow bump and all of those weird things that, that we've now started doing and have continued, right? Somebody did that the other day and I was like, what are you doing? <laughs> and, and, um, and so I missed that. I didn't miss, you know, the, the putting shoes on, all those various things. I certainly didn't miss driving in Atlanta traffic. Right. Um, yeah. You know, and, and so, and, and, the programs were great, you know, and I belong to several different business organizations, but I, I, when I sat down and thought about it, I realized I hadn't lost any business. Mm. And so that to me was key. So I was going more for the social aspects, which I mean, you know, that that's fine. But when I, when I really needed to, you know, think about and focus on business, online was where it was was you know most beneficial for me now some people you know and, and obviously it depends on your business as to to what you're doing you know if if say you're a, a local realtor nah you need to go to those in persons you need to shake the hand bump the elbow do the whatevers um yeah. and and really build those things but if you're talking to people who your potential clients can be worldwide then online really does work pretty well yeah, I, for for me and and a lot of folks that are listening, I've just started to get back out, go to conferences live mm -hmm. the last probably six months, right? Like is, is mm -hmm. right. We kind of reached that okie dokie. I did that and got COVID. <laughs> <laughs> right, 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 right. Um, I think a good mix has been my experience for me. And I think there's something about, that face-to-face -face when you're trying to build credibility for something that's new. When your networking and your business has been established for a long time and you've got a really good presence and, and referral base and different things, I think more online can make sense. When you're emerging something, that FaceTime and that effort and that consistency mm -hmm. is also going to matter. So right. I agree with you on the realtor <laughs> piece, but also stage of your business. Mm -hmm. 
um, in terms of doing that. Because most people, when you're uh, working on a new business, you're still crafting your elevator pitch. You're mm -hmm. still crafting right. how you build credibility mm -hmm. and what groups you should be a part of. And so you've got to try, fail, and adjust on mm -hmm. that network piece. The phrase that I like to use all the time is your network is your net worth. Mm -hmm. And it's the one thing that entrepreneurs do the least right. that could have the biggest benefit. Mm -hmm. um, and so I highly encourage, whether it is offline mm -hmm. or in person, that we really uh, <coughs> right our networking game. Because quite frankly, I've gotten lots of business where I've met folks. They recommended me to someone else. And that powerful recommendation is so much more valuable than all the SEO right. marketing stuff that mm -hmm. we're trying to do. Even though that stuff works, mm -hmm. I'm former CEO of a marketing, digital marketing firm. I'm still on the board of a marketing firm mm -hmm. and buy several marketing mm -hmm. firms. But that face-to-face -face relational build mm -hmm. uh, is what a new firm can cut through the noise right. and get invited to things. Well, and, you know, we talked about the fact that you started doing that when you were very little. Um, and I'm kind of one of those social chatty Kathy people, too, if you couldn't <laughs> already tell, right? Um, and... You know, but but it is it's so important to create that network. And I was sharing with you that I've been working with a young man who just graduated from college and, you know, he's 24 years old and talking to me about how important it is to build his network. And I was just stunned. I mean, you know, he's he's a former uh, college football player, so he knows the value of teamwork. He knows all of that. But he said, you know, that's he needs to get out of that and build his network. Mm -hmm. Because although he knows that, you know, it, all, alumni are always a, a good source of, of place, but, you know, his his network was really pretty small because as a college football player, that's all he did. I mean, yeah. you know, he and and the fact that that young man went, I need to build my network was just incredible, um, you know, and 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 he's also very personable. He says, thank you. I mean, he's just been a, a delight to work with. That's great. But it, it is, it's so important that no matter where you are in your career, you have that network. I think that, um, and it's whether that's young emerging talent, like you just mentioned, uh, somebody that's in a career change, mm -hmm. right? right? Which if you become new mm -hmm. in a sense, right? Because mm -hmm. you're branding yourself. Mm -hmm. Uh, I encourage folks, uh, you, we talked about LinkedIn in the pre-meeting. LinkedIn is one of the digital platforms that is still pretty pure to its purpose. Right. right? You don't it, see too many cat videos. Yeah, exactly right. It, the, the community has really self-policed and done a really, it's been a really nice job. And so I think people being present there is super important. And a lot of times I'll get questions from folks I'm working with. Well, what will I say? Mm -hmm. Right. What will I do? Um, one, complete your profile, all that good stuff. Mm -hmm. and there's tutorials for that. Share things that you like, that right. you learned something. Mm -hmm. You don't have to have this amazing idea or different things, mm -hmm. but if you like something, like it. Mm -hmm. Comment on other people's posts where they shared something with you that was valuable. Let them know that and share that content. Right. And so you can then start by just doing those steps as a mm -hmm. part of the community and then the easiest thing to write posts about are things that you've learned, mm -hmm. mistakes that you've made that you've learned from, mm -hmm. and wins that you're having in your chosen profession. Mm -hmm. And if you just get on some of those basics, you'll develop your voice online, mm -hmm. and then you can expand to, to other things and building a brand and thought leadership. You don't have to build a brand, right, like a multinational company. Right. But you are your brand. But you are your brand. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> You know, and, and I love that you bring up the learning because that's a big part of your book. Um, you know, as much as your parents valued education, you decided you weren't going to finish college. I'm one of those strange people that has lots of degrees. Um, <laughs> do you, well, my, my initial degree was in social science. What the heck do you do with that, right? Mm -hmm. um, all it meant was I didn't have to take a lot of science and math. Uh, you know, but... It, that what and and I I wrote this down because I wanted to make sure that I remembered this. You call yourself a competitive learner, and I just absolutely love that because it means that you always, always, always continue to learn. And so, talk to us a little bit more about that because, like I said, that that just absolutely fascinated me. I have a page of notes just on things that you've said throughout this podcast. I think being a competitive learner means being humble enough that everyone you come in contact with 
is your master in some way. Mm -hmm. There's something that they know. There's an experience right. that they've had. There's something that you can learn. Mm -hmm. That demeanor also brings people to you mm -hmm. because people like to share what they're good at. Right. People like to share their successes. Mm -hmm. So it's helped me build relationships. Mm -hmm. The second thing is when I learn about people and what they're good at, mm -hmm. I know who to call when I'm being a connector for others. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times you build credibility with someone you may want to sell to in the future by doing something that has nothing to do with you, mm -hmm. but helps them solve a problem that they need by introducing to them to somebody that they can work with on right. a problem that might not even be in your lane. Mm -hmm. So that environment of always learning to me didn't have to happen in a college classroom. Mm -hmm. I wanted to learn more applicable, real world, right now skills. And I was aggressively impatient. Mm -hmm. and, and I was ready to get out in the world, but I've always had mentors. And when I wasn't in a mentoring relationship, because some people don't have that, mm -hmm. I became a very avid reader. Mm -hmm. There was yeah, a I loved hearing, you know, in, in your book where you talked about, you know, when you were the security guard and you would go into executive offices and look at what their books were and think, hmm, I should read that too. That's and I just, I was, I thought that was such a cool tip. You know, if you're in somebody's office, what are they reading? What are they reading? Mm -hmm. And and you can ask folks, right? A, another thing that I did, um, and, and this is one of the cheat codes that I share with folks, when I'm having a 30 minute meeting with someone, I'll try to end the meeting <coughs> in 25 minutes and mm -hmm. I'll ask that person, if we end our meeting early, mm -hmm. can I use the remaining five minutes to ask you a question or two about how you've become successful? Mm -hmm. I've never had someone turn me down. Right. So that means I was getting five minute leadership mm -hmm. nuggets mm -hmm. from some of the most talented people in the world mm -hmm. for the last 25 years. Mm -hmm. How could that not change you? Right. And then because my ask of that leader was unique, mm -hmm. I became memorable. Mm -hmm. I wasn't just the person on the other end of the phone trying to sell them software. I was, you know, that guy, Don, he's always trying to learn things. Mm -hmm. I would encourage people if they were reading something that was powerful, I would say to an executive, if you're reading something along the way that you think could benefit me, mm -hmm. would you please just forward it to me? Right. And then over the years of saying that hundreds of times, mm -hmm. I've probably gotten 10, 20, 30 different, very relevant to me, my personality, my business articles. But then I stayed top of mind with someone mm -hmm. that was sending me something and giving me that gift. Right. So being a competitive learner has had no downside for me. Mm -hmm. It's built relationships. It keeps me sharp. Mm -hmm. And it's just way more from learning something new. Right. Well, and then it's reciprocal. You know, they share an article with you and then you share something with them. Um, so again, that, that keeps you in that top of mind to say, you know, hey, Don, I saw this article. I thought you might enjoy it, you know. And that's all you say. There's no sales pitch. There's no nothing in there. That's right. It's it's like um, there used to be a time where after a meeting, you would write a handwritten mm -hmm. note card to someone and you'd send it to them. Right. There were some business courtesies that are mm -hmm. not as relevant now mm -hmm. today. So how do we transition these things to the digital world? Mm -hmm. Right. And those are some of the things that I that I that I help executives do when I work with them. Here's the other thing that I would share that I think is super fun. We now can translate that to a video that you've seen, mm -hmm. a white paper you've read, to a book. Yep. The medium is not so important to, to extend on the point you made. It's the sharing. Mm -hmm. It's the sharing, and, and it's not just blasting it out to a lot of people. It's, you know what, John? I really thought you'd enjoy mm -hmm. this article on growing your sales force mm -hmm. because of where your business is and what I know you're trying right. to do. That they can really use and they can really value, mm -hmm. and people remember that. Right. Yeah. Because aside from anything else, they went, Ooh, he paid attention to me. That's right. And we all love that, right? We all love, need, crave attention. Mm -hmm. When you think about the things that make someone retained in a company, mm -hmm. salary is going to be pretty competitive, right? It is really the relationship they have with their manager and their leader. Mm -hmm. Well, what is a great relationship? someone that pays attention to you. Mm -hmm. The best managers or leaders that I've worked with that I've had are somebody that have given me compliments, sure, mm -hmm. but that has coached me to be better. Right. 
and done so in a way to where even if I needed to do something a little different, mm -hmm. coming from a place that they were going to make me more powerful. Mm -hmm. I remember my, my mentor I mentioned in the book, um, Grant Willard, he used to say things. He was like, Don, I want you to think about something in a little different way, because when you're a CEO, you'll have to understand this. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm a sales a given that you were going to be a CEO. And, mm -hmm. and, he just, and he projected that I had this amazing future. Mm -hmm. And that just, I would, and it made me want to listen to him more. Mm -hmm. So you're telling me this because of my future success, mm -hmm. right? Okay. And I'm, I'm taking notes. Right. On, mm -hmm. Because back to- And your, it was when, not if. That's exactly right. And he believed in me. Mm -hmm. Right. He was, he was expressing that belief. One of the worst things you can do as a leader to your team is have low expectation of them. Mm-hmm. Because they will meet it. Because they will meet it. And, and, and that's something that I've, when I think back of my career, of, of leaders, of partners, of friends, the people that are in my circle have high expectations of me. And that has helped govern my choices and my steps. And I wouldn't have it any other way. And if you have friends or people in your core group that are okay with you being average, you might want to switch that up. I was going to say, you need a different group. <laughs> you, need a different, you need a different group, right? Um, right. You need a group that'll cheer for you, that that is encouraging to one another, but that also pushes the best out mm -hmm. of you. Uh, right. And that's super important. Right. You know, and it does come back to being the son of a, a football coach because a coach is never going to coach somebody to be average or worse, mediocre. I mean, they absolutely want the best out of you. Now, are you gonna be the best quarterback? Me, Maybe, maybe not. Are you gonna be the best you can be? Yes, that's what they want. The other, the thing that that is also important is that trust is built, right? When you care enough to teach people to be their best mm -hmm. and people can really feel that. Right. And so as I've matured as a business leader, my words are more measured. My words are more thoughtful. Mm -hmm. I was a little uh, aggressive, assertive. Yeah, uh, you talk about that in the book. Early, mm -hmm. early in my, like, and so I had to, I had some work to do mm -hmm. as a leader, but my standards haven't changed. Right. I've just been able to learn how to message to broader groups of people mm -hmm. so that I could be a better leader. Mm -hmm. And again, that brings me back to, the diversity, equity, inclusion topic, that's one of the things we talk about leader with leaders a lot is giving and receiving feedback mm -hmm. and, and keeping it, how do we get practical? Right. And if you give and receive feedback very well, mm -hmm. you're going to be highly productive with the people that you lead. Mm -hmm. The big challenges that we have with, with rapport with folks, when you think about bad meetings you've had, mm -hmm. it's because of someone's tone. It's mm -hmm. because somebody was harsh and somebody was petty, right? Mm -hmm. right? It, somebody said something in public that was better served to be said in private. Mm -hmm. It is those interpersonal things that slow us down the mm -hmm. most. And that's the biggest thing over, I would say, the last 10 years of my career mm -hmm. that I've really dialed in on as a leader mm -hmm. uh, because that was holding me back. I didn't know it. I didn't I didn't understand it mm -hmm. until I had some, some folks I respect to kind of say, Don, you need to... Yeah, have you thought about thought about this, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and and go from there. So right. Well, and some of it are just simple things like how you do it. You know, I, sitting behind the desk, you know, lecturing somebody as opposed to sitting in the chair next to them. Um, you know, or I think we probably all had the boss, you know, and this is, you know, goes back to when we were in school, right? And the principal did this. You got called in, you're sitting there in the chair and they're either standing or sitting on the edge of the desk. So you're like, hello. Yeah. <laughs> you know? And I mean, that's just it, it, deliberately or not deliberately. I mean, that is an intimidation factor. Sure. Sure. So, you know, all, the things that we can do, and again, it makes it difficult if it's just virtual, but there are certainly ways to put people at ease. I mean, even if you're just saying, you know, hey, Don, those pictures behind you, those are gorgeous. Tell me where you got those. Um, you know, or I, I when we were first uh, you know, doing a lot of Zooms, I had somebody that said, you know, she didn't have a separate office space, so she had to set up in her bedroom. 
And somebody said, I really like that bedspread. And it was their very passive aggressive way of saying, you didn't make your bed today. <laughs> you know? and, and, and she said, you know, it, 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 it never really dawned on her that people were looking at what was, and, and it's, it's, you know, we, we all do that, right? You're know, like, we're looking if they've got books, what, is, what is that? What's that book that they're reading? Absolutely. Um, you know, and, and all of those things. And so, you know, just the way that you go about things is, and, and, you know, I, I think, you know, you, you mentioned, you know, how would you want someone else to treat your mother, your sister, your brother, your son, whoever, the person you're dealing with is somebody's mother, brother, son, whatever. And so treat them with dignity and respect. That is, that is so right. To echo a couple of points that you made, when I'm looking at your background and I see the brand and the microphone, right, the power hour, mm -hmm. right? It's those small things that you can do intentionally, right? To heighten that professional success, mm -hmm. independent of what that actual background right. is, so that people mm -hmm. focus on what you want mm -hmm. them to focus on. Right. right. And I think that is important. And then to your other point in terms of everyone, someone's mother, brother, sister, uh, or, or partner, um, a little bit of humility is something that a lot of our leaders in this world could use. Mm -hmm. Right. Like, like I'm all for people being passionate about their ideas, right. their beliefs, mm -hmm. political, business, whatever the case may be. But I think that we can share those views in a much more thoughtful way. Mm -hmm. I think that um, the one thing about social media uh, and our, our current tenor a lot of times is I think we're more harsh than is required to get the result that we seek. I, I got trolled the other day on Facebook. I'm like, really? <laughs> Yeah, like it's, 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 it's a little bit too much. And I think it's for those of us that have a different perspective to strengthen our voice. Right. Um, because a lot of times we can think that um, we're all against one another mm -hmm. when it's really the loud ones in the room that mm -hmm. are a small percentage. Right. And most of us want the same things for our families, for mm -hmm. our businesses, for, for, for growing our, our personal narrative and career. And it's, it's easier to cheer for people than it is to pull people down. Right. So I try to make it my business to find the goodness in everyone mm -hmm. I come in contact with, unless they are just highly intentional. Right. Uh, and then you just that. don't have anything to do with right. them. Right. <laughs> thank you, but no thank you. That's mm -hmm. right. That's right. <laughs> mm -hmm. Right. You know, and, and I think, you know, you know I'm, I'm in Georgia which as we are recording this, we have two very contentious political races Absolutely. going on. Now, I never post about any, I mean, no, not going to go <laughs> sure. there. But, sure. you know, it's whether it's politics, religion, sports, you know, you know, our, the, the Braves just lost. Oh, yes. um, you know, and, and but we have to agree that we can disagree and be civil about it. Um, you know, the, the person who trolled me was trolling me because I mentioned wearing a mask. <laughs> <laughs> and now the funny thing was, oh, I didn't have to say anything because everybody else went, what up? <laughs> you know? and, and, and then he unfortunately continued, then he got blocked. Um, you know, it was like, no, dude, I don't, I don't have to put up with that. And more importantly, I don't put up with you saying those things to my friends. That's exactly I mean, that was just totally inappropriate. But, you know, but, but there, you know, I think part of that is that we do have to say this is the line. Um, you know, I'm, I'm Star Trek fan and, you know, oh, when, awesome. when, when we, you know, when, when Picard says the line stops here, you know, you know that, okay. You know, and, and it's kind of like, you know, when, in your book, when you were talking about growing up, you knew just how far you could push and we all know how far can we push our parents. <laughs> That's right. That's and right. then if you step over that line, there's going to be consequences. There are consequences. And, and I would say that, um, unfortunately, well, I would say fortunately, uh, now, mm -hmm. but I was an experiential learner in some Oh, cases. yeah, yeah. So, mm -hmm. had, so the book is filled mm -hmm. with uh, a lot of my experiences, a lot of me pushing the envelope. Mm -hmm. uh, Which I love pushing the envelope. That's how we, we learn and grow. Yeah. As long as you're doing it from a thoughtful way is maybe the way to put it. That is right. <laughs> You know, and, and, and I, you know, I, I really, you know, empathized with the fact of growing up in the small town, you could do something wrong and, or something you weren't supposed to, 
And before you got home, your parents or big daddy knew right. about it. That's exactly oh yeah. I mean, there more than once I would get home and meet my parents at the door and I'm like, Oh, that, and they'd say, you know, we know you were doing such and such because that little grapevine, yeah. <laughs> you know, it was yeah. back then it was the telephone, but, um, but yeah, you know, no, no, that's you know, and, 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 and people knew who I was, you know, and yeah. I mean, you know, and, and, but yeah, it was, and, and so then you learned, okay, how can I push it and not get in trouble? Right. right. Um, you know, and, and, and if you had rational explanations like the Jolly Ranchers, you know, you told your parents but I'm making my own money. And they said, but you're breaking the rules, but I'm making my own money. <laughs> you know? Um, you know, and, and so as long as you can justify pushing that envelope, sometimes it's okay to do it. Often it's okay to do it. And you don't know until you try. And, right. and it's a good skill set because those are the kind of things that will move you if it's time for a job change, mm -hmm. a career change, mm -hmm. if it's time for you to go back to school, if that's right. what your, your calling is. And a lot of things that I think, you know, I would say to your, to your audience that I've done well, I've got a lot of things that the book will explain that I learned from. Mm -hmm. um, I wasn't afraid to try something new. Mm -hmm. I wasn't, and, I, and I'm not afraid of being bad at something new mm -hmm. while I'm learning. Right. And that is a really tough thing when you get to a certain point in life, certain point in career, mm -hmm. X, Y, Z, there's a certain status in you having the right answers. There's a mm -hmm. certain status in your position and different mm -hmm. things. And to put yourself back in that learning mode, mm -hmm. right, to build something new from scratch mm -hmm. is something that you have to enjoy or you have to believe that is worth mm -hmm. it to get what you ultimately want. Right. But it's a good skill right. to be able to learn something new. Yeah. You know, and, and we do that because of, as you said, who we associate with. Um, you know, and, and all that information, which is absolutely why it is critical for diversity, for equality, for inclusion, you know, all of those things, because when we hear somebody else's point of view, we might, again, we might not agree with it, but it should make us think, even if it's just to make us think, okay, I, I know I'm right. Um, but, but it is, you know, it's so important to be getting those other viewpoints and so tell us a little bit more about the diversity movement and, and at what is it that you do uh, with companies and with people? So the diversity movement was built to help companies build their DEI capability within the organization. Mm -hmm. We did it a little bit different in terms of we wanted to build products and tools mm -hmm. to specifically help folks uh, outside of just traditional training. So mm -hmm. we have what we call our Netflix for DEI. Mm -hmm. We have a 500 uh, video library wow. of two to three minute mm -hmm. vignettes mm -hmm. on DEI topics. Mm -hmm. So companies can subscribe to it. Their organization members can look mm -hmm. at these two to three minute videos with psychological safety. Mm -hmm. And then there's places where you can comment and share and there's a platform there. Mm -hmm. The second thing that we do is we have a membership cohort called DEI Navigator. So companies mm -hmm. that don't have a huge budget mm -hmm. can join a cohort. You get a dedicated DEI advisor and you get access to all of our best practices, wow. our research, our training, mm -hmm. our video library, our digital learning, but we do it on a monthly fee. So small businesses, $800 a month. Mm -hmm. A mid-sized business might be $3,000 a month. Mm -hmm. There's an enterprise package. Right. We wanted to make sure that DEI education, training, and technology, that no one got left behind. Mm -hmm. So we have price points for any size business and organization because we want to be here to help. Right. I love that. Well, now, how do people find you and connect with you? So the diversitymovement.com is a great place uh, for the diversity movement content. Mm -hmm. And there's a ton of free resources on mm -hmm. our website for you to get started and get to know us. And then LinkedIn uh, is a great way to connect with me personally. Okay. Uh, if you reach out, I'll reach back. Perfect. I love it. I love it. Well, Donald, this really has been very cool. And I tell people, you know, this is this is why I set a timer because we could just keep going on this forever, right? Um and so it, it has been so much fun. And I think it's definitely a conversation we need to continue. I appreciate it. So I would love having you on again um, because, yeah, I mean, this is, it, 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 we do need to continue this because it is absolutely critical that we are making sure that we're hearing every voice that is, is out there and getting as much um, information and being those competitive learners. Again, I love that. I just think that is the, is the greatest phrase. Uh, I appreciate but it. until we chat again, do you have any final thoughts that you want to leave everyone with? 
if you'd like uh, an opportunity to get to know me a little bit deeper and read the book, just go to donaldthompson.com uh, or anywhere that you would buy a book and you can buy Underestimated, a CEO's Unlikely Journey. I love it. I love it. Well, I have been having an absolutely delightful time talking with Donald Thompson, the founder, co-founder with his wife of the diversity movement. And until next time, everyone have a great day. Tune in for our next program for even more trends, best practices, and techniques for how to make your business a success. The Business Power Hour, hosted by Deb Creer, is proud to be part of the C-Suite Network.